guys are welcome to come find your seats. We're gonna get in, we're gonna dive deep into God's word. Thank you, worship team, for all that you guys do. Even when the system sometimes works against you, God is still good. Thanks, Jason. No problem. Can you guys give it up for the worship team? They come here every week to practice. They do. They put a lot of effort into it. It takes a lot of skill to play some of these instruments and to sing the way that they do. Out there playing his heart out on his bass. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Amen. By the way, actually, let me throw in a shameless plug in there. If you play an instrument and would like to play an instrument on this worship team, you could see Amanda over there, the blonde over there. Yeah, the one waving and smiling like she usually does. The greatest smile on the planet. Look at that. So if you play instrument, please feel free to go talk to Amanda. We would love to get you plugged into the rotation. And we have some, uh, some standards that we have for the worship team. But we would love to see if uh, you can be a part of, of the awesome things that, got, that is happening. Um, as like a year and a half ago, we didn't really have a worship team. We had like, it was, it was Shelby and Shaylin. And then that was it. And then Aiden came and everything changed. And then it just got, it just got, <laughs> it got so much worse. I don't know. I might shed a tear, JK. That's right. I'm so glad you understand that. All right, real quick, I'm setting a timer because I don't want to go over like I did last week, and your parents got mad at me. All right, guys, do me a big favor. How many have your Bibles here with you guys? How many are archaic in their methods and have the actual thing, the physical copy of the Word of God? One, two, that's it? Three? I mean, let me see your Bibles. Who's got like an actual, like, physical Bible? Not, a, not, a, not an LED one. Not one that you need to charge up. All right, three people. Wow. actually is an electronic Bible. I would encourage you guys, I would encourage you guys to get an actual physical copy of the Word of God. There's something about carrying it. I don't know. I just, maybe I'm just old. I just like reading it, like, for, not from a LED screen. But anyways, do me a favor. Would you guys turn to Genesis chapter 37? And we're we're going way back, way back. Before I start talking about what I'm going to talk about tonight, um, tonight I wanted to talk about something different. 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 Can you guys say different? Different. 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 I wanted to talk about something different. Hey, by the way, complete side rabbit trail. Does anyone, like, a whole bunch of girls are doing this now, and it's kind of weird. They, like, say, like, half the, set, half the word. They don't finish it. Like, probably we say probs. They're, like, probs, or, like, yeah. avi, or, like, <laughs> deaf. Like, why? Can someone explain to me why is this phenomenon happening? <laughs> like... Is it, is it, shh, is it laziness or efficiency? All right, neither? It's just dumb? Just don't do it. All right, all right. <laughs> all right, I feel like I started a war. Shh. 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 All right. So, I don't know, that was a rabbit trail. There was something that, like, gets, gets to me. I'm like, why? Why do you cut words halfway? Like, I don't get it. Like, and only some of them. But anyways, I forget why that came up to my mind. Uh, my mind just works and fires in all different weird ways. But uh, to, uh, the reason, what I want to talk about before we talk about tonight, I was, I was here to talk about something different. That's why I came to my mind because I was going to cut it in half. Diff. Doesn't work. So anyways, that's another way. That's another reason I can't do that because I can't cut the right words in half. But, and, and I was going to, I was going to, I had a sermon. I was ready to preach. And then God um, was like, no, I want you to talk about something different tonight. I want, you, I want to change your sermon. And I'm like, great. Could you have done this like a week ago, you know? And uh, so, tonight, so today I was kind of like working really hard to, because uh, I really felt like God wanted me to talk about this specific thing and this specific text. And I was like, all right, let's do it. And um, so anyways, that being said, uh, I, I want, before, before I, I, re, I read on and, and talk about stories in the Bible, I want to make sure that you guys understand that uh, in the Bible, there's, there's these amazing stories. And if you're having trouble reading the Bible, I remember being a teenager and it was hard. It was difficult. Like, I would read the Bible and then, like, 
three sentences in, I'd be out, like sleeping. Like knocked out. That's why I, read, I, I can't read at night. I had to do my devotions in the morning. Because if I did it at night, I wouldn't, get, I wouldn't finish them. I would just fall right to sleep. And one of the things that really, cha- that really changed my thinking when it came to reading the Bible, and I hope that you guys are realizing I'm actually right now challenging you to read the Bible more. Because one, you can never read the Bible too much. And two, one of the things that really was, uh, like I said, it, was, it would put me to sleep. But it's because I was reading it like I would read a newspaper. Or like I would read a blog online. Or like I would read like a Facebook, you know, message. Like I was just reading it to read it, you know. And the Bible, you shouldn't read it just to like check something off. You know, like, oh, I read Genesis 1 today. Like, that, you know, done. Bam, finished it, crossed it off. No, and, and I want to challenge you, and this is the approach that I want you to, 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 to tackle the Bible when you read it, okay? When you read it, I want you to, to, I want you to ask God to show you the marvel that's in his word, okay? And what I mean by that, I want, you to, I want you to ask God, I want you to say, God, I want you to show me what is amazing about what I'm reading right now. Because once I started reading it like that, and I was like, really kind of like, reading it and not just reading it just to kind of like go through but like reading it to try to understand it and to try to see how this applied to my life it be the word became alive it became marvelous and I was like wow like you know things like I would read John three sixteen, you know for God so loved the world and I would get stuck on that sentence like why why does God love the world why did he have to love the world when half the world would reject him you know when it cost him so much to love the world and I would start asking questions and I felt like I was digging deep and like I was I had not even finished a verse you know, I hadn't even finished one single verse. I was just, God so loved the world. And I was stuck having a conversation with God about why God so loved the world. And so this is what I'm not saying. I'm not saying just read one, one verse a day, okay? But what I'm trying to say is dig deeper. Begin to ask questions. Ask God. Say, hey, God, what is, what is marvelous about this? What is, what, what is the gem found in your word? All right? Can you guys do that for me? All right. Thanks, back there. Appreciate it. So, uh, Genesis 37. Hope you, hopefully, I've given you enough time to find it. Um, it is it is it's the first book of the Bible. It's uh, not that hard to find. But uh, verse 37, uh, chapter 37, verse 2, starting in verse 2, it says, "This is the account of Jacob." And then it says, "Joseph, a young man of 17. How many 17 year olds do we have in the house? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nice." Eight, 17-year-olds. Awesome. So hopefully this story will have a little bit more um, significance in your life. There's nothing to tighten this. This is annoying. Okay. Okay, whatever. So, so hopefully this will have a little bit more significance in your life. But 17, Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the son of Bilah and the sons of Zilpah. Then I'm so glad we changed names. I'm so glad we don't like had the same names, like, mom, this is my girlfriend, Zilpah, like, (laughs) not about it, so anyways, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them, so you have Joseph, all right, I'm just going to really quick tell you the story of Joseph, if you guys have never heard of it, hopefully you have, and you'll know what I'm talking about, but uh, right here, what's happening is you have Joseph being 17 year old, right, he's feeding the flock with his brothers, and then he comes back and tattletales, how many have a younger brother or that tattletales on you all the time? Right? Dude, it is like so frustrating when you have a tattletale. It really is. <laughs> so listen, listen. So for those of you guys who are older, you guys understand what it means to have a tattletale, right? So Joseph is a tattletale. And then as you'll keep reading, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't give you all the scriptures, but as you keep reading, because it's like five chapters long. But as you, if you keep reading, you'll learn a little bit more about Joseph. And how many are like the favorite of the family? And the favorite. I'm the favorite. I really am. Like, you are too, Amanda? No? No, you know, like, you know, like your brothers and sisters, you ever have, you have your brothers and sisters like come up to you and say, like, you're the favorite, or mom loves you more? That's your sister, so that you. How many have a sibling that you feel like your parents love more? <laughs> She's like, Right here. So listen, Joseph, right? Joseph, listen. Shh. Joseph is the favorite. 
right? He is, he is the favored one, right? So much so that his father makes him a tunic, right? And it's, it says it's long sleeved and it's like, uh, it's a robe of many different colors, right? It's, it's like, it goes all the way to his feet and it's long sleeved. And that's important for this simple fact that his brothers, they were all shepherds, meaning that most of their clothing back then, okay, if you're going to have like a, a robe that's made for you or tunic, it's going to be short sleeved and short, like to your knees, okay? The reason being is because you're going to go out in the field and it's kind of dumb to wear something really long with long sleeves if you're going to be working outside in the field because then you're going to get it dirty all the time, right? Does that make sense to you guys? So what really what is saying when his dad gives him this robe of many colors, what's happening is he's by definition telling us as the reader that Joseph didn't have to work as hard as his other brothers, how many of you have ever had, like, um, someone tell your sibling to do something, right, and then tells you, and it's, like, seven times as hard? You know, like, uh, like for example, hey, like, someone, you know, someone, like, let me give you a quick example. You know, my, my, my mom will tell my sister, hey, you know, go wash the dishes. And then, you know, she'll tell me, she's like, hey, go cut the lawn, front and the back, you know. And then she's like, wash the car, make sure you clean my room and your room and my sister's room. I'm like, it's not fair. You can't, you can't just tell my sister to go do one thing and then tell me to go do like 10 other things. So, so listen, Joseph, Joseph, not only, Joseph, not only is he a tattletale, okay, he's a tattletale, not only is he a tattletale, he is someone who doesn't, who doesn't really know what the hard working life is all about, okay? His brothers are all working hard, he's got 11 of them, and he doesn't know, he doesn't know how hard it is um, to work. So, and then he, not only is he a, a tattletale, he's kind of a brat, all right? So he has this dream, and he knows he's the favorite. He, he knows it. You, you know, uh, I'm sure you guys have brothers and sisters that know that they're the favorite. I know I'm the favorite. I don't use it to my advantage, but I am the favorite. And so he knows he's the favorite, has a dream, right? This dream comes from God, and he has a dream that, that comes from God, and he sees his, he's got his brothers around him, and then there's uh, barrels of, uh, of hay, that they have, and then he's standing there, and then all the barrels start bowing to him. And so he thinks that it's the, the brightest idea to go tell his brothers that one day that he had this dream, and really much, pretty much what he's saying in the dream without saying, he's saying, like, you are going to bow to me one day. Now, if your tattletale most favorite, you know, not hardworking brother comes up to you and says, you know, that one day you're going to bow to me, I know what that, I know as a teenager, I know what that would mean, all right? We would start wrestling, all right, with fists. So, so, this, so this happens, not only does it happen once, but it happens twice. He has another dream. And in this dream, the stars and the moon and the sun all bow down to him. And this time, his father rebukes him because obviously the father and the, and the moon, they represent the parents. And then the stars, rep- the 11 stars represent the kids, right? And they're all bowing to him. So his father's like, his father rebukes him and says, like, don't, don't, don't be running around saying stuff like that. <laughs> you know, like your brothers already hate you. And so, so I, hopefully I painted like a background story of what's happening in, in, in what's happening in Joseph's life, right? So he's, he's, doesn't know, he doesn't work hard. He's a tattletale. He's a favorite. And so he's kind of coddled. And every time something happens, he just kind of runs back to dad or runs back to mom and he gets, he gets safe. You know, like you ever had that like an annoying little brother or annoying little sister that like, you know, like punches you and then runs back to mom. It's like, oh, he's trying to hit me. Really annoying. (laughs) We have some family tensions in here. But so listen, so, so that happens, right? Listen up real quick. I want, you, I, I, want you to, I want you to listen to this real quick because I'm going to get to some of the points. Guys, listen up. Guys, listen. Where's my water? Can you throw me that water bottle, please? It's hiding. Thank you. So, so we have the story in the Bible. And then verse 19 happens, right? And it says, oh, actually before verse 19. So the, all, all the 11 other brothers, they're working hard. They're on the field, right? And then Joseph comes along late as usual because he doesn't have to work, comes to meet with him. And then while he's still far off, his brothers begin plotting on how to kill the younger brother, right? So, like, things have escalated pretty quickly. And um, so they're plotting on killing him, and then the oldest is going to say, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in a ditch. Which, 
I mean, kind of makes him look good in comparison to the other ones. So he's like, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in a well, okay? And then we'll leave him there, and then we'll tell our parents that, that a beast ate him, which is really messed up if you think about it. This is in the Bible. I'm like, this is messed up. Like, families back then, we're like, like I want to show my mom this and be like, look, we're just fighting. Let us fight. I'm not killing anyone. But so then verse 19 happens, and he says, here comes that dreamer they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. All right, let us pray real quick as, I, as, as we get into, into this word. God, I thank you, Lord, for tonight. And God, I pray that you would help me, God, to deliver this message, God, that, that, that you want me to deliver tonight, Lord. God, I pray that you would help me to just speak these points with clarity, God, and, and, um, and, and a, in a good fashion, Lord. I pray that you give me the words to speak, that you would not only anoint my lips, God, but that you would just, uh, that you would have your way, God, tonight. God, I pray right now for uh, the rest of the night. God, I pray that this word, God, would just be ingrained deep into our hearts, God, that your word, God, would be written across our hearts, God. And I pray right now that as we leave, God, that we would leave being made different because of the word that was spoken tonight. I pray all of this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. So the first, the first point that I really feel like God really uh, gave me as I was reading this today is the first part is, you know, here comes that dreamer, as it says in verse 19. And the first thing that I want to talk about is sometimes the dreams that God gives you, the things that God gives you, right, are the very reason why you have opposition in your life. For example, I was called into ministry, right? I had my senior year. And I wanted to go to Bible college, and my dad was like, mm, heck no. You're going to be an engineer, and you're going to come work for me. And that created a lot of tension between me and my dad. And it wasn't because I was doing the wrong thing. It was actually because I was following what God was telling me to do, and it created tension in my life. Same thing with this guy. You know, Joseph, his dream was given from God. The only thing that I believe he did wrong is he started sharing it too quickly. And sometimes the things that God speaks into your life, you just need to kind of keep to yourself. And you need to, you need to know that they're real. You need to know that God has given you those things. But they're not out for you to go out and tell to, you know, whoever is willing to hear. And so, but sometimes the, the dreams that God has given you, sometimes the things that, that you want to do in life, sometimes the, the passions that God has put in your heart are the very reason that you're, you're going to find yourself in a ditch or you're going to find yourself in problems, that you're going to find yourself in a situation that may not seem like God wants you in, but God actually has orchestrated it that way. So sometimes your dreams get you caught up in different problems. Sometimes they, 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 they're the very reason you're caught up in a ditch, but that does not mean that they're not from God. That does not mean the fact that you're in a negative situation or in a bad situation does not negate the fact that God may have allowed you to end up there. Because you can learn a lot of things from Joseph's story. As you'll see, if, you read, if you're willing to read, maybe tonight or some other time, you're willing to read Genesis 37 on, you'll read that Joseph goes through a whole bunch of other different trials. And he's got to clear a whole bunch of other um, hurdles and overcome a lot of different adverse moments in his life in order to get to where God wanted him to come at first. And there's a lot of things that you can pick up from Joseph's story. There's a moment where there's a woman that he's, he's serving in, uh, in Potiphar's house who's uh, an Egyptian. And, um, and, and she, tries to, she tries to sleep with him and he's like, no. He's like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, betray my master that way, right? And finally, she gets him incarcerated because she says she falsely accuses him. He ends up going, up, going in jail for the second time. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different situations that he's put in. The, he ends up in jail because a, a, car, a caravan of slave traders walk by where he was in the hole they was in. They get him out and him thinking that he's freed. I mean, that would be such a sad night, right? You think you're finally getting out. There's some good Samaritan that's out to get you out of the hole that you're in. And then you go from being in a hole to being sold in slavery, right? And then you go from slavery to going into Potiphar's home, right, where things are going well again for you. And then his wife incarcerates you again falsely. So you end up in jail another time. And then you find two people in jail and, and your character is so good that you start asking them how they're doing. They tell you that they're really nervous because they, they have these dreams and reoccurring dreams in their life. And he says, I know how to interpret dreams. God has given me that gift. He interprets, it, he interprets their dream. One of them ends up being the, uh, the king's cupbearer, so the one who drinks uh, the king's drink before he does so to make sure it's not poisoned. 
and he forgets about him. Two years go by, and then finally he's given a chance to talk to the, to, to the Pharaoh and to get out of jail. And then it's not only then that his dream comes true. And it's from the age of 17 all the way to 37 that it takes for his dream to come true. 37, 20, it takes him 20 years. It takes God 20 years to get him from the first place to the place that he first intended for him. And God, I want to I wanna say that it doesn't matter what, um, what, what hurdles we, 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 have, we face in life, that God always provides a way out. But, you know, throughout all the stories that we talked about Joseph, there's so many different ones that are just, so many different moments that you can learn from his life. I think the biggest one that we need to learn is that God is always in control. That even when, even when he's in jail, right, you don't see him, you don't see him complaining and being like, God, like, he's like, God did this to me, and he's distraught, and he's completely out of, out of sorts, and he decided, he, you don't see him giving up on God. You don't see him giving up his faith and saying, this, God hasn't done anything for me, this isn't working, I'm giving up. I'm just going to lay here and rot. There's so, many, there's so many people in life that when things don't go their way, when things don't go according to plan, when, things, when they hit a bump or where they hit an obstacle, they quit. And the first thing they start doing is blaming God. The first thing they start doing is maybe they don't blame God or they start blaming other things. And instead, instead of saying, you know what, I'm just going to hunker down. I'm just going to believe that God has great plans. I'm going to believe that God has something better and I'm not going to end up here. The first thing that we start doing is, is dishing out blame. And so I want to show a quick video uh, that has to do with that. It has to do with overcoming obstacles. And I want you to pay attention really quick because I guarantee you that you haven't seen this video. And the first time I saw that, I was like, wow, this is really, this is really amazing. And it's the, this is the story of, uh, of a guy who is, I think, right now a, phys, a physique model. But I want you to hear his story because I think it's, it's pretty amazing. And it's a person who decided that he could have given up, but instead of giving up, he chose to keep pushing forward. Can you guys turn the lights off as you play this video, please? I essentially don't have a pulse. You can check everywhere you want and you won't feel a pulse. So I'm pretty much the best looking zombie you'll ever see. <laughs> My name is Andrew Jones and I'm a professional fitness model living with an artificial heart. I always have to have batteries charging. At night when I'm going to bed, I'll plug my phone in and then I'll plug myself in to the wall outlet to make sure I have power overnight. In 2012, I was diagnosed with a cardiomyopathy which affects the heart's efficiency to pump blood. I was incredibly ill at the time and I was admitted to the ICU for four months where they had to implant what's called an LVAD, which stands for left ventricular assist device. And it's considered an artificial heart. It's taking over the work of my heart for me. These devices, uh, the two batteries and the computer, these are what are powering and controlling the artificial heart to make sure that it's working efficiently and working properly. I started feeling strong again when uh, I was recovering after having the artificial heart implanted. And of course it didn't all come at once. I took baby steps and I found myself back in the gym sooner than later and I got my strength back and once I'm able to find the right match for a heart transplant, I will no longer need my artificial heart. At first I was upset about having an artificial heart and then there was the moment where I realized that this is my life for now and either I can dwell and feel sorry for myself or I can continue doing the things that I love to do the best way I can and I haven't stopped. I'm proud of the scars that I have from my surgeries because scars are beautiful. They're a part of you. They tell your story and no one can take that away from you. Isn't that crazy? My man literally has no pulse. Like, his heart doesn't work. And he's in more shape than I am. <laughs> I don't have an excuse. I don't have an excuse. And you know what? If anyone had an excuse, it'd be this guy. But instead of sitting and, like he said, instead of dwelling on the problems that I have and the cards that I've been dealt, he, does, he decided to say, you know what? I'm going to keep doing what I love to do. And that's my second point. 
my first point was that you're going to face opposition. You're going to face problems. You're going to face obstacles. There's things that are going to come up that are going to be unforeseen, and they're not going to be in your plans. They're not going to be in the way that you thought things were going to go. My second thing is, my, the second thing that I want to talk about is when those things happen is keep doing what you're good at. You see, Mo, uh, not Moses, Joseph, he got put in jail the first time, and then the first thing that he does Right, he, uh, he. No, I'm sorry. He gets sold into slavery, and the first thing that you see him do is go to Potiphar's uh, house, and he, immediately he becomes the number one, uh, his number one employer, his number one slave. He, be, he, he just, he's so good at administrating. He's so good at what he does that it says uh, that Potiphar no longer had to think about anything. The only thing he thought about was what to eat that day, because Joseph was so good at what he was doing that he had everything else under control. And then his situation with, his, with Potiphar's wife happens. He gets thrown in jail, wrongfully accused. And then, again, there's two people there, and what does he do? He interprets their dreams. He keeps doing what he's good at. Then another, two years pass by because they forgot about him, and then there's an opportunity for him to meet the Pharaoh because he keeps having dreams coming up. Uh, he keeps having dreams every night, and, again, he's given an opportunity to do what he's good at. Listen, when you, when you overcome, when, when you have a problem, something hits you, something happens in your life that, you, that is unforeseen and that you don't understand and that maybe you're like, D- I didn't deserve this. Or I, there's nothing that I did or could have done better to end up where I am. I want to challenge you to keep doing what you're good at. Keep doing the things that God has given you. Keep using the talents that God has given you. Keep using the abilities that God has bestowed upon you. Because those things are going to make room for you in other places. Not only to keep doing, uh, God is going to provide a way out, so keep doing what you're doing in the meantime. But the last thing that I want to talk about is that everything happens in God's timing. Timing is so hard. Timing is difficult. It's difficult for uh, young people, older people. It doesn't matter. Young people want things to go faster. Older people want things to slow down, right? It's, that's, just, that's just life, you know? Timing is very difficult. We want things to happen now, especially in America. Everything is so instant. We want it now, now, now. If, the, if your internet browser stops, like, working for four seconds, you want to destroy your computer, right? Anyone else with me on that? Yes, right? You're like, why aren't you working? You, like, click 45 times. You're like, you should be working instantly. We want things instantly. <laughs> there was a time with AOL. You could press on a button, come back half an hour later, and your page still hadn't downloaded yet. That was, that was a hard life. But, but, but listen, so not only keep doing, what you're, not, keep doing what God has given you. Keep doing the things that God has called you to do. Keep doing what you're good at. If you find yourself in a situation that, uh, that, that, that is difficult and, God, and you know that God has told you to do something, keep doing it. You know, that's why I don't, I don't, um, I don't penalize or, or, or make anyone feel bad that's playing a sport and misses on a Tuesday night. If you, if you have a sport, if you have a talent that God has given you, if you have an amazing ability to play basketball, to play volleyball, to play soccer, or croquet, or chess, or you're a mathlete, or whatever you are good at, okay? Whatever you're good at, I want you to do it for the glory of God. I don't want, I, I, I don't want to hold you back from the things that God has for you to do. And if it's wrestling, if it's, I, it doesn't matter what the sport is, if it's golf, if it's archery, whatever, if you're good at it, I want you to do it. And I don't only want you to do it, but I want you to do it for God's glory. And in doing that, I want you to be an example of Christ in a dark world. You know, it's, it's, it's funny. People say, like, don't you get upset when people are, don't show up because they have something else to do? I'm like, no, 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 I, I, I don't. I send them as missionaries to their, to, their, to their sports teams. I send them as missionaries to their education systems. I send them as missionaries. I want them to be there, and I want them to make a difference. I want them to be so good. Right at what they do, that people are like, dude, how good? Why, how is it that you're so good? You don't have to. Pra- you don't even practice that much. And I wanted to be able to say, because God has given me an amazing talent, and I want to glorify Him. That's that's what I want to see. That's what I, I think that that would bring more people in the off season than me being like, hey, make sure that you're here every Tuesday night. And if you're not here, I'm, you know, shame on you. It's just that's just not how it works. I don't believe in shaming people into the kingdom. But so keep doing what you what you're good at. But lastly, everything is in God's timing. My last analogy is, uh, actually, I'm running out of time already. Wow, time flies. Can I, have, can I have you play, or you have a pad, some beautiful pads in the back? We don't need pianists anymore. We have, we have electronic stuff. 
Uh, anyone ever played, or maybe when you're a kid, you uh, you know those coloring books, right? They always had that page that wasn't coloring, but it was like you had to like connect the dots. Oh, yeah. I used to be so bad at those. <laughs> I don't know why. It's like literally just like one, two, three, four. But like I, I used to hate it because sometimes like they want you to do a curved line. Like for example, a dinosaur and you're drawing a tail. It's supposed to be a curved line, but it was like a straight line. You know, because you always do straight lines, right? You know, like now I have a dinosaur with a straight line as a tail. I'm like, this doesn't work. But how many, how many have ever seen those things, right, and tried to picture it without doing it at first? You ever look at it? It just looks like a whole bunch of dots. It looks like, it looks like a starry night. It looks like a sky just with a whole bunch of dots in it. It doesn't look like anything. It doesn't look like a picture. It doesn't make any sense. It just looks like a whole bunch of purposeless dots on a piece of paper, Right? Until you start like drawing the first line, connecting the first two dots, then the third dot, then the fourth dot, fifth dot, sixth dot. And if you're like me, you'd skip four dots and then go back and you'd be like, what did I mess up? But little by little, right, it starts taking shape. It starts looking like something, right? Maybe like a dinosaur or a dog or like a, you know, winter wonderland. I don't know, but it starts looking like something. And I want to, I propose to you that it's the same way with God's timing. You know, when you're in the middle, when you're at the dot, okay, and the situation is hard, it doesn't make sense. You're like, what? Why am I here? Why is this dot here? Why? What's the bigger picture, right? You ever ask yourself that? What, what does God want to do? Why, why does this happen? Why, why did I end up moving here? Or why, why, did, I, why did this happen in my life? Or, or why did this situation have to go this way? And then you're in the dot. You're stuck on that dot. You're stuck on this individual dot. And you're like, why, why, why is this dot like this? And it's not until you move to the second dot, the third dot, the fourth dot, the fifth dot. And maybe the whole time you're like Joseph and you're like, what the heck, God? What? Like, like I, I'm trying. I, I got it. I was a brat. I got it. I was the favorite. You threw me in jail, right? Now I'm a slave. And then I'm trying to do good. Right? I'm at the fourth dot now, and then I go back to jail, and I feel like I'm taking steps back. It doesn't feel, this doesn't feel like progress. This feels like I'm taking steps back. Right? And then I do, I do good there in jail. While he's in jail, I forgot to mention, he gets to be the number one uh, individual there that he takes care of other inmates. Right? He's doing good, and he's administrating, and he's trying his best. Right? And then he has an opportunity to get out, and then he ministers to some people, and then they forget about him. Right, and he's stuck in another dot. And it's not until 20 years later that all the dots kind of fit in. Where he's, you know, we, we look at this story and uh, we automatically think, oh, he was supposed to be the second in command of Egypt and that's it. That's, that's why God wanted, gave him those dreams and that's, that's the purpose that God had for him, right? That's when we think of the story of Joseph, he was going to come and become the second most powerful man in all of Egypt and that was the reason that God wanted him to go through all of that. That's, the, that's, that's what I thought when I first read the story. And the thing is, is that if we don't look into it a little more, that's what we'll find is that we would, we'll, we're going to think that all that God wanted him to do is, is for him to be the second most powerful man in Egypt. And that's where the story ends. But see, what we don't realize is that there was a famine going on. And that his family was going to be part of the famine, just like a whole bunch of other people around Egypt. And because God sovereignly moved him around all those dots, made him second in command of all over Egypt, his family ended up surviving that famine because he was the second in command of all of Egypt and was able to not only feed his family, but he was able to feed all of, uh, of the people around Egypt because he had the wisdom and the insight and the closeness with God to be able to prepare for the seven years of famine that were going to happen. So you see, God wants to do some things, some amazing things in your life. I'm going to ask you guys to stand up real quick. It's, um, I have a last, the last scripture that I have here is in Romans if you guys could put it up real quick what then shall we say about these things if God is for us who can be against us can you go to the next one he who didn't spare his own son but delivered him up for us for us all how would he not also with him freely give us all things go to the next one who could bring a charge against God's chosen ones is it God it, it is God who justifies who is he who condemns 
It is Christ who died, yes, rather, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Could oppression, anguish, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Even as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's what I want you to pay attention to. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We just read, there's a part that talks about what can separate us from God's love, right? Sword, famine, nakedness, all these different things, talking about all these different circumstances that people find themselves in day in and day out. And he says, no, no, in all these things, in all the things that I just mentioned, in all the problems of life, right, in, in a family member having cancer, in someone going through divorce, in, in, in whatever situation you may find yourself in, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I'm going to ask you guys to close your eyes and bow your heads. See, the reason I think that God wanted me to speak on this tonight is to remind you guys that we are more than conquerors. Because it's something that's so easy for us to forget. You know, we get stuck in one of the dots and we're faced with something that's difficult. Or we're faced with, an, with something that is seemingly unsurmountable. And it's very easy for us to forget that God has called us to be more than overcomers. And that in all the trials and all the tribulations that we would face and all the sufferings that, that, that we would face, that God not, not, is not only with us, but that God's going to do some amazing things through it. And just like the story that we saw about, this, about the guy who technically has no heart, I feel like there's a lot of us who in, in, times, of difficult, in times of difficulty, we decide to dwell on the fact that there's a trial in front of us. So we decide to dwell on the things that make it difficult for us to move forward instead of dwelling on the fact that God wants to do something in the end of it and that you're not going to stay there and that God does not want you to perish where you are because he, in fact, wants you to be more than an overcomer. And at some point, all the dots are going to connect, but that takes faith, and it takes faith in a God who loves you. So tonight... Maybe you're in this place and you're saying, man, you know what? I needed that. And I believe that it's at least for one person. It's at least for one person that to be reminded that we are more than overcomers through him who first loved us. That we are made to overcome. We are not made to be, to be dwellers. We're not made to be people who dwell under circumstances around us. We are not made to be people who look at the circumstances in the mountains before us and shudder in fear. But we are made to be people who in faith tell that mountain to move and it moves. We are made to be people who overcome. We are made to be people who go through the trials and tribulations of this day and say, you know what? I have faith in God that this will one day make sense even if it doesn't make sense in this moment. God, I thank you, Lord, for tonight. And God, I pray right now, God, that you would just move inside of us, God. God, that you would give us the faith over an overcomer, God. That no matter what situation we may find ourselves in tonight, Lord God. God, or maybe tonight everything is perfect, God. But you are preemptively speaking this into our lives because we're going to go through some hard things, Lord God. And God, each and every one of us, God, will face trials. We will face tribulation. We will face suffering, God. We will face, uh, we will face difficult time, Lord Jesus. We will face hurdles in our lives oh god and but i pray that you would remind us god that you have made us more than overcomers god that tonight that we would be reminded god that you are wanting us to overcome god that you are wanting us god in the times of difficulty to keep doing god the things that you've called us to do god that you have called us god to keep pressing through god because it builds character and ultimately character leads to hope lord and we hope in you god our hope is found in you and you alone lord god so, God, for those who, God, right now are, hard, are having difficult times, God, for those, God, who are looking at a mountain, God, and saying, God, I don't know how, this, how, I, how I can climb this mountain, Lord, I pray right now, God, that they would have the faith to be able to look at the mountain and say, mountain, be removed, and that that mountain would be moved, Lord God. That they would have the faith not in who they are, but in who you are, God, and that they would have the faith to believe, God, that all things, God, work for those, for the good of those who love you, Lord. God, I ask that you would give us faith tonight, God. God, I, I'm not asking for positive thinking. I'm not asking for something for us to create in ourselves, Lord. But I'm asking you for us 
to have faith in you, God. For, uh, for you to give us peace of mind, God. For the peace that surpasses all logic, that surpasses understanding, God. That surpasses uh, everything, God, that goes against it, Lord God, in the times of difficulty, Lord. God, I pray that you would bring, that you would just have peace reign on us tonight, Lord God. That you would have, that you would give us, God, a, a sense of peace in, in every situation that we are, that we're faced with, Lord God. And God, I pray if everyone and anyone in this place, God, has something heavy on their heart, God, I pray that we would bring it to you, God, that we would bring it to your cross, God, because that is where we lay all of our burdens down, Lord Jesus. God, that you would remind us tonight, God, that we are made to be overcomers, God. We're not made to dwell, God, in, in, in our circumstances. We are not made to be complaining, God, about our circumstances, but to keep doing what you've called us to do, Lord God. And that in the end, all things will work out. And I pray all of this in your mighty name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Guys, as always, we have some youth leaders that are going to come up in a few seconds. And if you have any anything, if you, if you want them to pray for you, if you want to pray with them, please do not hesitate. If you have something on your heart that you want to share with them, please don't hesitate as well. But for everyone else, it's 830. You guys are dismissed. Please leave quietly and respectfully as some people are going to want to pray. I'll see all of you guys next Tuesday night. God bless.